Hello, I'm, uh, I'm Jeff Green, the CEO and founder of The Trade Desk, the largest independent DSP in the world. So I wanted to just tell a little bit uh, of the story of how we decided to go public and use that to frame my presentation today. Um, it was probably about nine months before we went public, we went public in September of last year, that I started taking serious meetings with, with uh, uh, some of the biggest names on Wall Street. One of them that I met with, we sat down, and about five minutes in the meeting, he said, what, this is an ad tech meeting? And then his quote was, who the fuck set up this meeting? <laughs> uh, uh, another meeting, only a few days after that, I said, uh, you know, ad tech has been one of the most hated categories in all of Wall Street. Uh, I think it's probably us and mining that are the two most hated segments of the economy. A and the guy's response, who was a portfolio manager, was, I think you're giving, uh, I don't think you're giving mining enough credit. <laughs> uh, uh, so people thought that we were absolutely crazy. In fact, when we were going into meetings, they were saying, what's wrong with your business? There must be something wrong with your business or else you wouldn't be here. Uh, um, <laughs> So uh, I worried that they were right. Uh, um, and the night before we told our employees, you know, it's one thing to do all this prep, to write to your S1, to do all the work to go public, but uh, uh, it's one thing to do all the prep, but it's another thing to tell your family. And it felt to me like right before Thanksgiving when you go home and tell your parents you're getting married or some big event, you know, you're pregnant or dropping out of school or whatever. Uh, uh, so the night before, I tell all the employees that we're, we're going to go public. And, and what I had planned to do and what, what we ended up doing was uh, at the end of that meeting, we, flipped, we pushed the button to make the S1 go out to the world. So we're disclosing to the entire world uh, all of our financial details, including how much money I make, like all, everything. So the night before that, I literally stayed up all night. It felt like my wedding day where it was like, there is no going back. And this is, I'm making a career decision that is like 10 years of the, ne uh, the next 10 years of my life because there's no easy exit after that in most cases. And of course, I'm also thinking about uh, a whole bunch of, uh, of people who, are, who probably had the same experience, but then things didn't go so well for them. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, Yumi or, or, or any of the, uh, the millennials, any of those, uh, you know, rocket fuel who had had an amazing run, uh, they had all had high hopes. Uh, what made me think it was different were the things that were going through my mind. A and I ultimately said, not dissimilar from my wedding day, screw it, let's do this. <laughs> I, I want to find out. I'd, I'd rather try. Uh, uh, so I want to tell you about the things that I was thinking about that made me positive. Because I, if there's anything that I hope to do today, it's to sort of change the paradigm a little bit in our discussion. Uh, and essentially what I said is somebody's got to break out. And what a bunch of the Wall Street people were saying is just wait for things to get better. Come out at a time when things are better. And my response was, well, what if I don't think they can get better unless companies like me go out and, and, and do well? I don't see who can go out between here and better besides us. So how do I break out of that? And they're like, oh yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, 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 but I ultimately said, hey, somebody's got to break out and, and it might as well be us. So I, I, I want to back up and just talk about uh, uh, the history of advertising for just 60 seconds. So in 1955, some guy walked, uh, or is driving down the road with his son in the, in, the, in the pickup truck next to him. They see this billboard, they walk into McDonald's. Uh, uh, if you then go up to that guy and say, hey, why are you here? I don't think he's going to say, oh, I saw the billboard and I came in. And in fact, if you ask him, hey, there was a billboard that, uh, that you passed. Have you passed it before yet? Passed it many times. Is that the reason you came in here? He would say, I don't know. I've seen 10,000 ads for McDonald's. If you ask the franchise owner, hey, you bought that billboard on the side of the road that's just the exit before people get off to come into this, uh, this store, uh, is it working? They would say, I don't know, uh, but uh, I'm afraid to take it down. <laughs> people are in the store, 
I, I might as well keep doing it. That's, that's what advertising has historically been. Uh, uh, and we have gotten so much better than that. So I want to spend the rest of my presentation talking about what I think are the green shoots. I think we spend way too much time at conferences like this one talking about minutia and details and problems and, and little problems, and we sometimes lose sight of the big picture. So if there's anything that I'm pleading with you to do today is to just change the paradigm a little bit to remember the big picture. Because uh, we are doing, and I, I, I know that this sounds like something that would be on the television series Silicon Valley, but we are changing the world through advertising. Uh, or said more precisely, I think we are doing the most effective advertising in the history of the world. Because advertising that has historically been effective was something like door to door, where you're doing one to one advertising, where you can customize the message and you can be super effective. Uh, but you couldn't do that at scale. And all the rest of advertising was like that billboard. It was spray and pray. You put up a broadcast, or you write on the side of a cave, or you do whatever. You put up some sort of announcement, and, and that's it. There's no targeting. There's no customization. And there's no attribution, just like the McDonald's scenario that I just described. There's no way to know if it worked. And so people don't know which half their advertising works and all that stuff that we've heard again and again and again. But for the first time in the history of advertising, we can be super precise. And we can be super precise at scale. I would also say that digital, we, we have, I think sometimes we have a little bit of an underdog complex. And maybe it's because guys like me were at ad agencies that had digital departments that were always the redheaded stepchildren, right? The, a, a digital was not even a thing. I would say digital is still not a thing. Digital is a way that you do things. But now that digital is more than 50% of the spend, we, we've arrived, right? Like, what we're doing now is the core of advertising. And, and in fact, to most, uh, to most uh, people that we're advertising to, who are arguably, uh, you know, as, as, as people get older, uh, um, everybody's using technology. Everybody. Uh, so I, I would say one of the things that shows that we've, we've made it is there is this sense of inevitability that many of us who've been in this industry for a long time never had. Like, there was a time when RTB could have failed. There is a time when ad exchanges would have, could have, uh, have been thrown in the garbage and never have existed. It is now impossible to stop it. So because of the inevitability of it, uh, I think that we should be focused on, on what's, how do we get to the next level without dwelling too much on, on the negative details, and we should certainly shed ourselves of the underdog complex. So just a reminder as to how far we've come. Uh, so the average baseball game has 146 pitches on both sides. So we have 292 pitches in a baseball game. Uh, I personally believe that one of the big problems that advertising has always had is that there has been no price discovery. And price discovery is just that economic concept of knowing what you're buying and selling. What is the value of that McDonald's billboard? I have no idea. It would be great if I had more data so that I could figure out what value it added relative to all the rest of my advertising assets. That's what we can do for the first time in advertising. On the grand scheme of things, we are doing more sophisticated advertising where we can actually answer the question, what is an ad worth? And how far into that are we? What I would argue is that there's an adequate level of price discovery on about $12 billion of global advertising. Uh, of the 500, I'm sorry, of the $650 billion. So if you run that math, uh, uh, we're just over 2% done. Or if you want to, in baseball pitches, we're in the middle of the second batter. So we've got so far to go, if you believe like I do, that eventually all 650 billion will be transacted programmatically. And just like digital is no longer a thing, uh, uh, I think the same is true of, of, of real-time stock trading. Just like we don't use the term RTB like we once did, nobody talks about real-time stock trading. Nobody talks about digital stock trading. If you called your broker to transact, people would say, why? The same thing is happening with digital today. And there's absolutely no reason for us to do things in a manual way. But despite the fact that we know that's inevitable, we're only on the second batter. That creates tons of upside. 
that, I, to me, that is super exciting. And it's super exciting when you see uh, brands like Time say, uh, we're, we're programmatic first. So uh, it, if there's any one message that I want to articulate more precisely, it's that I think we're having the wrong discussions. I think we're having the wrong discussions at, at, at conferences like this. Uh, uh, because I think we spend a little bit too much time talking about brand safety, uh, talking about fraud, talking about all the problems. And those are real problems, and those are things we do need to have discussions about. But I also think we're adding way too much complexity to our discussions. Not, not internally. I think inside of the, the, the sort of the operators, which I think all of us are, uh, I think it's totally healthy for us to talk about that. But if you go to the average Wall Street analyst, or you go to the average client, and, and you start explaining all the complexities that we've been talking about for the last couple days, they get lost. And so when Wall Street asks me, and every single meeting I take, by the way, I've answered this question at least 400 times in, in the last few months, why is, is Facebook and Google, and when we talk about Google, we're talking about Google.com most notably, why are they getting all the incremental spend? And I would argue that it's not because their efficacy is meaningfully better than the programmatic efforts of everybody else. Uh, uh, the, the reason why they're getting so much of the incremental spend is because you can spend money on Facebook in 90 seconds. They have made it easy. They've made it simple. They haven't created super complicated stories where they go in and confuse the hell out of the client. Uh, I, I think too often we're confusing people in our space when, when we're trying to educate them, I just encourage you to, to think about what are the right conversations to have so that we can accelerate adoption and make it easier. I, I would also argue just on the friction point, you know, people have made the point many times how easy it is to spend money in television versus uh, uh, it is to spend in digital or in programmatic. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that easy is the best answer. I, even my own business model isn't geared or just focused on easy. But I do say to my team all the time, we have to make it easier. So it takes 90 seconds to spend money on Facebook. It takes 30 minutes to spend uh, on the trade desk. Let's cut that in half. Let's cut that by 2 thirds. Because I think we can still give them the power and the transparency, the visibility, and the control uh, without making it so complicated. So, uh, uh, so let me just tell you what I think the future looks like, and, and maybe this is the biggest reason to be optimistic about the future. There will be fewer ads. Uh, they will be way more relevant. They will cost more. And again, I represent the buy side. Uh, I'm okay with that because they're going to be worth it. This is the future of advertising. This is the future of media, and it's better for everybody. So uh, uh, unlike so many things in the global economy where you need to be afraid of automation or, or uh, so many of the, the sectors of our economy are under pressure, uh, I think there's nothing but blue skies ahead for this industry. And I also, I, I also think that there's room for everybody to win. Um, and you may say, well, what about all the consolidation that's happening? It, it wasn't that long ago, two or three years ago, and, and maybe five plus years ago, it was still the same, where every one of these conferences, every single deck had uh, uh, the customary LumaScape slide, right? Where you had to put the logos up of every person in the space. And in fact, that was a way that we pointed to it and said, see how complicated our space is? Uh, uh, as if that were a feature. That's a bug, not a feature. Uh, um, uh, uh, but now we're looking across the industry. We've talked about a bunch of M&A that's happened lately. There are a bunch of companies that are struggling in our space. Uh, uh, that's okay on the macro. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that companies need to go away or that we need fewer of them. And I actually, throughout the history of our industry, have never once said ad tech has been overinvested in. It hasn't. It never was. There was never a point where it was over-invested in. There were people that made investments in the wrong companies, but ad tech itself has never been invested in because it's a $650 billion industry and growing. It is only going to get better. There is room for every single company in this room to, to succeed, and there's room for more of them. 
But getting rid of business models that have 50, 60% take rates, that have no transparency, that, uh, that extract more value than they add to the ecosystem, those companies should go away. And, and we should all be, those of us that are adding value, delighted by that fact. When we just, uh, we just had the attribution conversation, we said, who gets hurt by it? The companies that don't add value, the publishers that don't add value, because we're gonna stop advertising on them. We're working like hell to stop advertising on those that don't add value. So, all right, now let's get to the controversy. Um, so, uh, uh, marketplaces win and walled gardens don't. Uh, uh, I think you can make the argument that no economic wall from a government perspective, and maybe I'm making, uh, uh, as long as we're throwing controversy, let's talk about our current administration. Uh, uh, no wall has ever worked. Didn't work in China, didn't work in Berlin, and it won't work on the border of Mexico. It will not work around YouTube. It won't work around Facebook. And I'm not saying that those aren't great companies. YouTube is unbelievable. The amount of reach that they've created, the amount of fear that they've created in the biggest media companies in the world, unbelievable. Unbelievable that that company didn't exist a decade ago. Of Facebook, one of the most successful technology stories ever. I mean, they have changed the world through their social network. But it is not optimal to, to monetize 25% of the internet by yourself. I think eventually marketplaces do a better job of that. Eventually, it will have to be open. I say this as a reason to be optimistic because I believe that ultimately programmatic pipes and price discovery and buyers having the ability to choose will, will, will be a thing even inside of what now we view as walled gardens. So header bidding. So there's, a, there's this, other, this other phenomenon that I, I feel like I've been spending the last two years of my life unraveling at, uh, with Wall Street. And that's that when companies had disappointed in the past, they would come in and, and they would do what I think sometimes uh, uh, technology vendors and, and agencies sometimes do with their clients. And that is, we spew technological excuses. We come up with super complicated reasons. So like what would happen is, yeah, we missed our quarter, but it was because this boogeyman header bidding came out and it took my wallet. And it's super complicated. Let me show you the flow chart, right? And Wall Street's like, oh my God, like I had no idea this was a thing. I was invested in this company. I believed in them. And then this super complicated thing happened. Uh, and so then effectively what people were saying to me in every meeting was, hey, what's the super complicated thing that I don't know about? What's the boogeyman that's gonna steal your wallet? Like explain that to me. And I think we do ourselves a, a disservice when we use like technological nuance as an excuse, and when we jump into that nuance, instead of just calling it for what it is. Here's what happened. Header bidding was competition. We always said it was gonna get more competitive. We've been saying for years we wanted the waterfall to go away. It, it, it's starting to go away, and what that forces is an open, effectively an open auction, where uh, it's a meritocracy. We get to compete. And what I've been saying in my business is, just give me a chance to compete, that's all I want. Uh, so it wasn't any you know, technological boogeyman that took any one company's wallet. All that happened was competition. And that's awesome. That's what we're all asking for. That's what we've all wanted forever. Just let me participate in a fair fight. Uh, so this is a great thing, and, and, and let's not complicate the issue. Doesn't mean we don't have to know the nuances, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, so this is the slide that I was the most nervous about putting up. And, and let me just uh, uh, disclaim really fast. I am not saying that uh, brand safety isn't important. I am not saying that viewability isn't important. I'm not saying that fraud isn't a humongous issue. And, and, and most notably of all, privacy is something that has to be respected uh, uh, of our consumers and those that are using our, our, our services. But we do have to to recognize that these are just speed bumps in the sense that they won't stop programmatic from happening. Uh, these, these are not the end of the world. We will get better. And the reason why I say they're a speed bump is because you know when Google uh, uh, was up here a few minutes ago and talked about the efforts that they're taking in brand safety, I believe them. It will work. We will get better at it. It's in everybody's best interest to do that. 
everybody except for those that are committing the fraud. And on one side, you have the entire media industry fighting against it. And then on the other hand, you have a few scrappy, under-resourced people who are trying to take money. Ultimately, that big media world is going to win. So I say that as, just as reassurance that we'll get through this. I'm not saying that we don't have serious problems in all of these categories, and you could add ad blocking to the list, uh, um, but we uh, absolutely are gonna get through that. I've already taken most of my time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go fast. Uh, uh, so we, the, uh, the programmatic engine, are powering media. We're making it so that media can afford to create amazing content, and that's meant really great things for television. I think the most under-discussed thing right now in programmatic is how much amazing content is coming online for programmatic purchase in things like CBS Access. And that Hulu has made more of their inventory available this year than ever before, even though they could sell 100% of it at upfronts if they wanted to, because there's a shortage of digital ads. Many of you may know we added the CFO of Netflix to our board a, a, a little over a year ago. And you may say, why did you add somebody that doesn't serve ads onto your board? I believe that company has changed television more than any company arguably ever. And they've also made it so that programmatic TV is being accelerated, meaning programmatic ad funded TV. And the reason why, incidentally, is because there are only so many subscriptions that consumers can afford to have. Uh, 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 and I think Netflix is one of them. But I think nearly everyone else has to be ad funded. And it's just like your regular TV, which is 500 stations and 490 of them are ad funded. TV content is at the top of its game. We all know that. But in order to sustain that, they need quality ads with more money. I think fake news is, is a bigger problem than all those others that we talked about because it affects way beyond just the ad universe. It also affects just our national discourse. It affects politics. It, it, it affects a lot of things. So I do think that we as a group can do as much or more to stop fake news than any other group of people by not funding it, by not putting ads on things that we know to be fake, and working with companies that can identify that so that uh, we stop advertising for it. I stood in front of a room of, of journalists a couple years ago uh, in, here in San Francisco where I said the future of journalism depends on your ability to understand programmatic advertising. Because we need real journalism in this country, and we need that uh, uh, to have enough money to survive. All of, uh, so many of the real journalists in our country have struggled to get the money that they need to to survive. We need to educate them, we need to help them. So when I hear Time say, we're a programmatic first shop, that gives me so much reassurance, but I hope it gives you reassurance that we can have an impact. Super exciting. Uh, so data-driven hiring is happening forever. So in a world where we didn't have data, which is most of advertising for most of our history, uh, uh, you know, the Don Drapers of the world, the Mad Men, uh, uh, that was the way choices got made, that was the way the industry was run. It is very different. All of you are data driven in, in the decisions that you make. You wouldn't be here otherwise. But that creates job security, and in fact, we need thousands more like all of you. What an unbelievable time to be a part of programmatic. Attribution is getting more sophisticated. This conference is such a commentary on that reality. We are finally having the tough discussions with our clients about how we actually assign credit. Uh, uh, I think you can make the argument that last click attribution, especially in a world of search, uh, uh, doesn't reward proper advertising. I think you can even make the argument that what is called search advertising isn't really even advertising. That to me, what advertising is is that you you inform people about something new, and you go win hearts and minds. Uh, uh, when somebody types in, buy Verizon phone, the advertising's already been done. A at that point, most of it is actually navigation. And so uh, uh, I think as we move towards a better discussion around attribution, the, the surface area of the funnel's all at the top, where you're creating awareness and winning hearts and minds, and that's where more dollars will go as attribution gets better. That's great news for all of us. So we are finally having the really tough conversations too, which I, I, I think one of the big problems or one of the biggest tough conversations that hasn't been had in the history of programmatic very often is the one where 
brands are effectively saying to agencies, I want you to give it to me for free, and I want it to be good. Uh, and that's not realistic. And what that encouraged agencies to do is to find ways, sometimes secretly, to make money. That's not healthy. Uh, uh, and then there's also been discussions about, hey, what if I bring it all in-house? And that hasn't been very healthy in most cases. Uh, but what that has forced is the healthy discussions that are happening today, which are, okay, how can I make it so you can make money, and how can we also make certain that you're going to be more transparent? And it's working. The NASDAQ just la launched a, a futures exchange or a forward market. That's unbelievable. We've been talking about a forward market for a decade in this space, and the NASDAQ just announced that they launched it. Uh, um, there are countries like Indonesia, countries like uh, Singapore, countries like Japan that I think will be 100% programmatic before the U.S. will be. A and all of those markets three, four, five years ago said, ah, not sure if programmatic's for me. There's conferences like this happening all over the world. Every major media market in the world is going programmatic. Every country, every company, every medium has to have a programmatic strategy. Considering where we've come from, just unbelievable where we are. So this is my last slide. I just wanted to highlight that things in programmatic have never been better. It's, it's never been brighter. The opportunities in front of us are unbelievable. And I'm especially excited by the impact that we can all have on both media as well as things like journalism. I really do believe that we can impact those things for the better by funding media. So if you, like me, think TV is at the, at the top of its game, the only way to perpetuate that is to make it so that they can create more money, so that they can create more content. And I think the expertise and power that will actually generate that is in this room. Thank you very much.